Okay, well, we're very excited to have Dr. Glider Hernandez with us today. He's a lecturer at Durham Law School, all the way from UK. Uh, this is the International and Comparative Law Center seminar series. And I'm just going to turn the floor over and let uh, Dr. Hernandez take it away. Thank you, Don. Um, well, hello, everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here in Jackson, Mississippi today. Um, thank you for the fantastic invitation. Uh, I'm uh, really looking forward to um, getting some feedback and some comments today. My paper is drawn from a book that's coming up next year, which is based on my PhD thesis called The International Court of Justice and the Judicial Function. I'm specifically interested in how judicial institutions participate in the development of the law, especially international judicial institutions given in the international legal systems um, rather indeterminate nature, at least relatively speaking, but also absolutely speaking. Anyhow, I won't be getting into that today, but what I'll be speaking on specifically is identity function and the judicial character of the court. Essentially, the manner in which the court constructs its judicial identity and through it constructs a claim to normative authority within the international legal system. Now, within any legal system, whether it's international law or domestic law, an important social function of the law is to prescribe standards of conduct that are then obeyed, albeit generally, not absolutely obviously, as any criminal lawyer can tell you, but that are generally obeyed by that society and by, uh, by the society that the legal system tries to regulate. In that respect, if a judicial institution works within the legal order, it is inextricably tied to upholding the principles and the purposes of that legal order itself. No judicial organ would last very long if it didn't conform to those principles. And in that respect, a judicial institution is fundamentally a creature of the legal system which it purports to inhabit. It is, it is that perspective that I wish to approach the International Court of Justice from. I think it's really important, before we understand how the court interprets the law and applies the law, how it situates itself within that legal system. Now, if you look at the structure of the court, the court is a successor to the Permanent Court of International Justice. I, I, I don't know how familiar everyone is with, um, with international law, but I'm just going to presume a basic knowledge. So you have the Permanent Court, which is um, constituted under the Covenant of the League of Nations. And that Permanent Court, um, carried out both contentious and advisory functions. So it resolved disputes between states that were brought before it, and then also provided legal opinions, uh, what in Canada we would call references, to political organs that would guide them in making, in formulating policy and taking decisions. These two functions survived with the UN Charter. And with them survived a number of structural features. For example, um, the fact that only states can appear before the court, which is under Article 34 of its statute, the consensual character of its jurisdiction, i.e. no state can appear before it without its consent, and the sources of international law that are enumerated in Article 38. That's a really important aspect. I won't be able to touch upon it today, but the fact that the sources of international law have existed by and large untouched for 100 years is, is worthy of note. The particular innovation, though, of situating the court in the post-Charter era was the fact that the court was declared to be the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Now, that is a key institutional difference because rather than merely providing advice, the court is an organ of the institution and thus, one, one could argue, and one does see that in its judgments, that the court feels itself and sees itself as bound to uphold and to protect the aims of, and purposes of the UN Charter itself specifically with respect to the maintenance of international peace and security and the resolution of international disputes peacefully. That sounds fatuous in some respects, but as you'll see, I'll try to develop some of the ideas further. You'll see that there's, there is, there's a specific mission embedded within the court to resolve disputes through the law. And we see that, for example, um, a famous judgment which involves the US is the judgment regarding the hostages in Tehran when the Iranian students stormed the US embassy. And there, one of the objections raised by Iran was that um, th this, this is beyond the jurisdiction of the court. It's a highly political dispute. It um, does not comport legal aspects. And the court, in, in answering that question, said no. It rejected that claim. And it alluded to the systemic function. And it said, and it, it, it wrapped itself right up in the UN Charter. It said, it is for the court, as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, to resolve any legal questions that may be an issue between the parties, and the resolution of such legal questions by the court may be an important and perhaps even decisive factor in promoting the peaceful settlement of the dispute. I think that's an important claim. It takes the court out of the traditional function of a court as an organ of the law, merely applying the law, and it situates it within the system. 
even if one contests the extent to which the international legal system is a system like a domestic system, I think that that sort of claim merits unpacking. And um, I see that I don't have too much time, so I'm going to try to <laughs> go a bit quickly. But I do want to put out a couple of caveats before I get into the substance of what I'm going to say. And these are caveats for all domestic lawyers, in essence, everywhere, although I suppose it, it, it applies especially here in the United States. Um, but an important aspect that I would caution against in approaching the court is to resist the temptation to analogize from our domestic law conceptions of what is a court. Even basic concepts like what is a judge, what is a dispute, what is a party, these concepts carry with them connotations that we bring from our domestic legal training. And that's inevitable. We study domestic law by and large before we come to international law. This is not something that we should do, though, with international law. The international legal system is fundamentally different, and I could talk for hours about how it's different, but I'll try not to. And I just want to point out a few things that are relevant to my argument. First of all, obviously, sovereignty is not vested within a legislature or a centralized law-creating organ. Sovereignty is diffused amongst states who are the subjects of international law. In essence, it's as though you collapse the electorate and parliament, and you have the subjects who are bound by the, by the, by the laws, also being the ones that create the laws. There's no delegation of sovereignty, there's no lawmaking function. With that comes the idea that there's no pre-existing social contract. Uh, now some might claim that there is the existence of some sort of nebulous international community. Uh, in a later chapter in my book I argue actually very strenuously that the court has decisively rejected any further notion of that. But be that as it may, the court exists within a legal system or perceives itself to act within a legal system where very few community obligations are said to exist. Essentially, the court views itself within the legal system constituted by the Charter, which is to prevent um, the outbreak of war, to maintain international peace and security, and maybe to cooperate together to, to facilitate a few specific purposes. But it doesn't have a constitution, not in the sense that we understand within a domestic legal system, where there is an idea of public order or basic public values. Uh, the German constitution is, is an excellent example of a very deep and well elucidated series of norms and values. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms might be another example. The other extreme would be the international legal system, which has a set of human rights conventions that states sometimes sign up to, but where there's no, there's no qualitative sense that these are higher law or that they constitute some sense of objective justice. Another point, which moves specifically to the judicial function, is that, again, we have to distinguish uh, the international court from domestic courts. There is no separation of powers because there is no legislature. So in that respect, the court is not reacting to the activities of other law-creating organs or law-applying organs. And the second one is that the court does not possess ipso facto compulsory jurisdiction. And this is very important, and I want to get into this substantively. The court the court's jurisdiction depends on the consent of the parties. And this is a basic point that you teach in Public International Law 101. My argument, though, is that this is relevant specifically with regard to the court's function, because throughout the court's interpretation and application of substantive law, the court demonstrates a preoccupation that if the parties are not consented to its jurisdiction, there may be repercussions for it. Now, I'm not going to make the claim that consent is absolute, because if consent were completely absolute, and this, this goes into, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit with inherent powers, then the court could decide nothing. My, my claim, though, is that the court's preoccupation with consent colors its interpretation and its application of the law. Um, in a couple of recent cases, in armed activities on the territory of the Congo, this is an interesting case, because this is a case in which Congo and Rwanda faced off, where the Congo alleged a violation of Article 9 of the Genocide Convention or excuse me, a violation of the Genocide Convention, and it tried to drag Rwanda in, alleging Article 9. Article 9 confers jurisdiction on the court, but Rwanda had entered a reservation to that, claiming that there is no jurisdiction. Now, the Congo's claim was, the reservation is incompatible with the object and purpose of the Convention, which is to prevent genocide. And the court said, uh, which is use cogens, which is a peremptory norm of international law, and any treaty obligation should be null and void if it faces against that use cogens. The court rejected this. It said, yes, there is such a thing as use cogens in international law. There are such things as referring pre norms. It was a little late. It was in 2006. I think uh, other courts had recognized it as early as in the 1990s. But the court said that consent was of such importance to the acceptance of its jurisdiction that it was unwilling to view 
the, the possible breach of a peremptory norm as overriding the importance that it placed on the consent of a party to rule before it. And this caused quite a bit of consternation um, amongst the judges. There's a jointly penned opinion um, by judges Higgins, Coymans, El Arabi, Awada, and Zimmer, in which they took issue with this point, and where they said, where they claimed, it's, it's just not self-evident that a reservation to Article 9 could not be regarded as incompatible with the object and purpose of the Convention. And then they made an interesting policy statement. They said, it is a matter for serious concern that at the beginning of the 21st century, it is still for states to choose whether they consent to the court adjudicating claims that they've committed genocide. And it must be regarded as a very grave matter that a state should be in a position to shield itself from international judicial scrutiny against any claim that it might have committed genocide. Now, more recently, and in a slightly less, um, in a slightly less obvious way, the court declined jurisdiction in the application of the CERD Convention, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Georgia-Russia case. Now, in that case, uh, very briefly, Georgia submitted an application before the court right after the outbreak of hostilities when um, Russian troops entered um, the territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. It, three days afterwards, Georgia instituted both a request for provisional measures and an application claiming and alleging a violation of CERD. The compromissory clause in CERT requires that states negotiate as a precondition for being seized. And so both states at the preliminary objection phase produced lots of materials showing, on the one hand, that there had been negotiations taking place or a call for negotiations. At least this is what Georgia tried to construct. And on the other hand, Russia pointing out, and rightly so in many respects, that despite negotiations taking place, the violations of the Racial Discrimination Convention were not specifically alleged, or the convention was not cited by name, or only the words ethnic cleansing were used, etc., etc. Now, the court, which referred right back to armed activities in the Congo, and uh, you know, again affirmed that consent is the indispensable element, looked at all of this as a whole, and decided that the evidence in itself did not specifically cite the Racial Discrimination Convention, provisions of that convention, and despite years of bilateral negotiations by, between the parties on the status of the disputed territories on other crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, etc., said that there was no jurisdiction that could be had on that case. And um, specifically in that reasoning, you see a very formalist turn. The insistence on negotiation as, 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 a, as a formal procedural act rather than a substantive engagement by the parties um, without expressing views on it, because I did work at the court just before that case was decided. Um, it, it is um, the, first, the first negotiation between the two parties as to the disputed status of the territories was in 1993. But, you know, I shouldn't say too much more. Anyhow, my claim is, decisions on the substantive law such as this, decisions such as the nature of use cogens and its application vis-a-vis -vis its opposability to consent, are the natural expression of the fact that the court's jurisdiction is founded on that. And it's quite possible that it is precisely because of this that other international courts, um, the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO, the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, have moved away from the idea of consensual jurisdiction. And, um, well, you know, for those of you watching and those of you today, if you buy my book, I spend quite a few chapters discussing um, both how the court's um, drafters, how the drafters of the statute agonized over this idea of compulsory jurisdiction and on what effect it's had on the court's concept of the international community and even on its, the nature of the international legal system as to whether it is a determinate or indeterminate uh, legal order. Anyhow, it sounds discouraging what I've been saying up to now, um, and I don't mean it to be so. I think though that it's a, it's a backdrop to what's coming next um, because even though the court does see itself as preoccupied with consent and does interpret and apply the law in that manner. This is not to say that the court is a political organ, merely beholden to the parties, a, a servant to the parties, etc. The court, in fact, um, makes a number of claims that would go actually against this, that even as it positions itself as, um, as, a, as a legal body that is beholden to the parties to the extent that it, their consent matters, it also makes several claims to judicial authority through what, um, what um, Chester Brown and others have called um, the claim to inherent powers. These inherent powers are claimed, I mean, it depends on how you see it. One could say that the inherent powers exist by virtue of the fact that the court was instituted as a court. Others could say that states, through ratifying the UN Charter, and through it, the statute, because the statute is an annex to the Charter, 
have given their consent to this more remotely. So, for example, the United States, which does not recognize the compulsory jurisdiction of the court, nevertheless consents through its ratification of the UN Charter and its payment of dues to that body, to the existence of the court, and to the necessary fulfillment of the court of its functions as stipulated by the Charter itself. Now, that, that helps to an extent, but it doesn't get us all the way there, because a number of the court's powers that it's claimed have gone beyond what is stipulated for within the statute. And I'd like to unpack those a bit. Um, if one accepts the notion of inherent powers, one presumes certain objective ideals as to what a court of law can do, and whether a court participates, for example, in the sound administration of justice. That, that's the claim that I would put out today. That's the claim that the court itself has made in the nuclear test judgment. Um, when it recognized that it had inherent jurisdiction, the nuclear test judgment was the judgment on the cessation of nuclear testing in the South Pacific between New Zealand and Australia on the one hand and France on the other. In that, the court um, suggested both that there were inherent powers to take certain actions, uh, specifically with regard to indicating provisional measures, but also that it had to observe certain inherent limitations. And what it did is it claimed that it's fully empowered to do this and that that power derives from the mere existence of the court as the judicial organ established by the consent of states, and that these inherent powers are conferred upon it so that its basic judicial functions can be safeguarded. And now there's a doctrinal debate as to whether the idea of inherent powers goes too far because it's a municipal analogy, again, you know, the caution that I gave earlier, or that simply put, the very conception of a court exists objectively outside whatever rules of procedure we can put before it, outside whatever constitutional structures we can put before it. That debate I'd rather not get into that into here. What we see with the court is that it derives it partly in consent, but it also makes allusions to the sound administration of justice, to its very existence as a court of law. And I think, I think that suggests that at the very least, it moves beyond that consent-based paradigm. And I'd like to enumerate a few of those powers just to show precisely how it does so. Um, la compétence et la compétence, or the power to determine its own jurisdiction, the power to set its own procedure, the power to indicate provisional measures or interim measures of protection, the fact that it has the, the right to define its own rules of evidence, the power to interpret and revise its judgments, and even the power to permit the intervention of the third party. Now, the last three or four I probably won't get through because I'm aware the time is elapsing, but um, I'll start with compétence de la compétence. Um, the idea that the power has the court to set its own jurisdiction. Now, Article 36, paragraph 36 of the statute says so. It says, the court, if there is doubt as to the jurisdiction of the court, that is a matter for the court to decide. But the court itself has rejected that this is a power conferred by the statute and by states. It says that, it said in, um, ooh, excuse me, in legality of the use of force and in the interpretation of the Greco-Turkish agreement in 1926, it says that this provision merely reflects a general principle of procedural law recognized by arbitral tribunals for hundreds of years rather than confers its competence to do so. And it, th then it is looked at other tribunals and it is confirmed, so it, it's its word, that other tribunals also have this. In, in the Guinea-Bissau v. Senegal appeal on the arbitral award between those two states, it essentially upheld the right of that tribunal to review its own jurisdiction. Now, it, it is only logical that a court must have the power to review its own jurisdiction. And there's a simple logical exercise in this respect. A court without this power would have only two choices. It would either have to accept every single application brought before it, or as soon as one of the parties objects, it would automatically have to decline, merely because that, that, that party is, is competent to decide whether the court has jurisdiction. This is the essence of what the court was doing when it rejected um, what is called the so-called self-judging reservation that the United States had entered vis-a-vis -vis the ICJ. I'd rather not get into that now because that case opens up a number of other interesting issues. But in essence, that's what, what was at stake uh, um, with, with that reservation. The idea that the United States and the United States alone could determine that a matter was within its jurisdiction or not. It, that would go against the idea that Article 36.6 um, confers that power on the court. Anyhow, moving on from that, Article 30 of the court statute allows the court to set its own procedure. And what is interesting about that is that the court is given discretion to ensure, um, to, 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 ensure to, to set into place the procedure that it, that it calculates is best suited to ensure the administration of justice and that is most in conformity with the fundamental principles of international law. 
That's the court speaking itself in Mavromatri's Palestine concessions back in 1924. What is interesting about that is that even though the court has, um, has no specific and express power within the statute, it basically, has, um, it, it basically has the mandate to fill in whatever gaps it sees fit, and as such, what it has done is it's elaborated rules of procedure, a resolution concerning its own judicial practice, and a number of practice directions to the parties, which are basically polite ways of asking the parties to submit the documents in a certain way, to respect time limits, etc. But what is interesting is the claim to autonomy that this power represents, the idea that it can set its own rules independently from intervention from others suggests that it, 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 is, it has a conception of what is a proper judicial proceeding. And it has applied that, proper, that conception of what is a proper judicial proceeding um, to the decisions of the United Nations Administrative Tribunal. In the decision, I will give you the citation, Application for Review of Judgment Number 158, it explained, in reviewing whether that procedure was a properly judicial procedure, it explained whether um, that, 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 that depended on whether um, the equality of the parties was safeguarded, whether the principal Audi Alteran party was safeguarded, um, whether the tribunal was obliged to give reasons, etc., etc. I'm not suggesting that this is radical in any way. What I am suggesting, though, is that by the court elucidating and arrogating for itself, defining for itself these powers to be properly judicial, the court is making a claim to autonomy. And that claim manifests itself later on when, for example, uh, the court um, adheres to its own body of case law. Now, to, to an American or um, English um, Commonwealth um, common lawyer, it's natural for us to adhere to precedent. Precedent is binding, in fact, uh, or at the very least must be considered. There's doctrinal support for this. The legislator drafts its laws in conformity with this. This is not accepted in international law. And it's, if anything, it is forbidden in most civil law countries with specific articles in the civil code directing judges not to use prior judicial decision. There's nothing self-evident about precedent. And yet, what I'm arguing here it, are, are the sorts of um, foundation stones that the court then uses to then adhere systematically to its own case law, which I think opens up a number of interesting questions about the court's claim to um, normative or semantic authority within the international legal system. Now, um, I'm just going to see how much time I've got left because I'm worried that um, I've already been speaking for 22 minutes. I'm going to skip the rest of the inherent powers. Um, there's the indication, I'll just enumerate them very briefly, but the court, through the indication of provisional measures, has declared them to be binding, even in the absence of specific um, empowering, them, empowering words in the, in the statute. It has done so as a necessary in, in, in incident to its jurisdiction. Its treatment of evidence, Gradually, the court, despite no indications that it had to do so, moved towards an adversarial model, which is more similar to the English and American legal systems and those of the civil law framework, um, where the parties bear the burden of proof to make their own claims, and it's shown itself quite reluctant to go out and uh, seek the truth. It has rejected the idea, the inquisitorial model of the French system, for example, where the judge can you know, commission experts to, to, to review the evidence, etc. The court doesn't do this. Um, the interpretation and revision of judgments, which is, is an incidental feature of its jurisdiction, is a scary one because in some respects it allows the court to um, appeal itself, in short. And the court, within doing that, has set very strict criteria through which it, it sees, well, A, it channels and conditions the interpretation and revision of judgments on consent, but B, it also places its autonomy as the actor best in power to interpret and apply how it should do that by itself. Now. Jumping then from um, the, the court's claim to autonomy there, I'd like to talk about how the court grapples with the concept of justiciability, which should be understood differently than in the domestic, American domestic context. The most important thing is how the court has consistently arrogated for itself, or, or maintained, that it is an organ of international law. And that is a different claim than being an organ of the United Nations. One is a legal system, one is an international institution. They're constituted differently. And the court has gone beyond merely placing itself within the UN system, but has conditioned itself as a legal organ. I'm, I'm bordering on moving towards Hart's concept of law and the idea uh, that certain law-applying actors function within that system. I'm kind of alluding to that point, not entirely, but this is, this is I think, in its essence, what the court is doing. Um, that, that also justifies the court's adherence to precedent, because if it's ruling on law, then its statements are a reflection of the law, and it should be free to cite itself. And also, 
um, justifies its um, obligation to give, uh, it's all right, it's all right, um, justifies its practice of giving reasons, a practice which um, was put into the statute but has evolved over the first 20 years of the court's existence. Um, the court used to have these shorter judgments with very few citations, and um, the right to dissent of judges crystallized incrementally over 15 years rather than um, starting on the basis. So, anyway, the point I might then try to make is that the court exercises its functions as an organ of international law. It places itself on that legal plane. It does not decide on issues of domestic law unless they are relevant to the interpretation and application of international law. Um, and a number of corollary doctrines arise necessarily from it that basically also arise as almost inherent powers as well. Um, jura novit curia, or um, the court knows the law. The obligation and the practice in through which it applies the sources of international law in Article 38. And even possibly, and I'm not going to go this far, but this is Hirsch Latterbach's claim, uh, a role for the court to construct and to safeguard an international rule of law in capital letters. These would then serve as justifications in turn for the internal, the inherent powers that the court claims to be exercising. Now, an interesting term, I'm actually going to skip this one, but an interesting way is the way in which the court applies equity. But very briefly, the court has the power under Article 38, Paragraph 2 of the statute to decide based on equity if the party is directed to. Now, two things have happened. The, the parties have never directed the court to decide on equity, and possibly rightly so. I mean, there would be interesting conceptual questions as that would arise as to whether um, even two countries as friendly as my country, Canada, and the United States would go to the court and say, we would like you to decide this dispute. We would like you to ignore all of our rights, all of our obligations under law. And we'd like you to just think of what is fair. I don't think Canada would like to do that, for example, in the portion of the water, which we have, <laughs> have a high supply of and is in need these days. But, you know, the fact that no states have ever done so signals both reluctance by states um, to submit to the authority of a tribunal merely because it is authoritative, and, but rather the view that we, we will respect it so long as it adheres to the law that we ourselves have created. And the second point is, the court, even though it has recognized the existence of equity as a general principle of the law, it, is, it has been very careful to delineate and to confine its application of equity in front of equity, within the law. So rather than situated as an overriding principle of the legal system that can come and change things, the corrective feature that we see in, um, in, 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 in the English common law, rather than do that, it situates it within the terms of a treaty itself, within, um, within customary law, or within a general, more rarely, within a general principle of law in areas where the, where the, where the, the provisions of the treaty might be read in their context, etc. But it has never ever departed from that, and it's shown an extreme reluctance to be regarded as applying equity against the law or above the law. Another one is the political questions doctrine, which uh, is an important one in the United States. And it, it has been argued a number of times before the permanent court and then in the international court. Um, the court, now, now, in its initial period, the permanent court sometimes shied away from settling questions that might require decisions of a non-legal character. And it said things, for example, like in the Mosul opinion and the Austro-Germans Custom Union's case, it said, these disputes have legal aspects, they have political aspects, we'll focus on the legal aspects, and we'll try not to make them extend too much to the political aspects. Uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, after 1945, the court has more, more robustly sought to confine the legal aspects of the dispute. So in conditions of admissions to a state, the court refused to attribute a political character to a request, which framed as it was in essentially judicial terms, could, could admit of a legal answer. Although it recognized that the legal answer had political consequences, it refused to consider those political consequences and set itself up a test that said that no matter how sensitive the political questions, we will answer the legal aspects of a question put before us. In the more interesting cases in which it did it, it did so in the um, case concerning um, the uh, consequences of Security Council Resolution 273 on Namibia, where it, um, where Namibia, South Africa was essentially making the claim that the, the collapse of the League of Nations basically left it with sovereignty over Namibia, which the United Nations declined. Um, that political dispute, a highly political dispute, um, suggested that it might make it impossible for the court to decide. That's what South Africa contended. The court rejected that. It said, no, we, we can answer a question on the legal consequences of the resolution. And it applied the same approach in the nuclear weapons advisory opinion. 
Although, and, and again, another plug for my book. <laughs> but um, the nuclear weapons advisory opinion is interesting because the court arrives at an answer that is not an answer. It declares something neither prohibited nor permitted. That is conceptually interesting. But before that, the fact that the law was so contested and so political was used as an argument by the nuclear powers that the court shouldn't even hear the case, that it should decline to entertain the question altogether. And the court there, it cited Namibia, it cited conditions of admission of the state, and it said, no, if there are legal aspects of the question, no matter how contested the political attributes are, we will answer them. It repeated the same reasoning on the legal consequences of the construction of a wall in occupied Palestinian territory and the unilateral declaration of independence by the provisional institutions of self-government in Kosovo. Uh, both highly contentious recent disputes that have to come before the court. Now, what this suggests are two things. One is that the court is confident, be be begins to see itself with sufficient confidence that it can make legal pronouncements even when those will become embroiled in a wider political dispute. And two, it's a claim to autonomy. Again, it's a claim that despite this indeterminate and complex legal system that we have, despite the adherence to consent, despite the fact that we do pay lip service to it, we are making a claim for, to independent authority, authority that is independent from consent of the parties. I will try to conclude. I had a whole section, um, I won't talk about it, about the court's advisory role within the UN. But I think that um, for the purposes of this discussion, what is more interesting is how the court conceives of its role in the development of international law. Um, one has to start from this, one has to proceed from the starting point that the court has no formal role in lawmaking. Uh, unlike in many domestic legal orders where the court has a secondary role or a subsidiary role, um, one sees that primarily in the binding character of judgments. But the court's formal role is merely to declare the law. Its pronouncements are only to be concerned with the law as it is, and it falls not to the court to pass judgment on the political or moral consequences of what it says. These are the court's own words in um, the Southwest Africa judgment of 1966. Um, there's nothing in the statute that suggests that the court has a law creative role. Despite being a principal organ of the United Nations, despite having the advisory power, the court is not empowered in, in any respect, for example, to fill gaps in the law or to, um, to examine the law and finding it lacking, reinterpreted in such a way that um, it, it, it is aligned with the fundamental principle of the law itself, etc., etc. Um, Article 38, which directs the court to apply the law, it says apply treaties, apply custom, apply general principles, and you may refer to judicial decisions and the writings of authors as subsidiary sources, as means for the determination of the law. And that's important. The court has upheld this in many of its judgments, in Icelandic fisheries. It literally refused to pronounce on a question. Um, on the, the, the law of the sea, because that was during the period of what they called the Third United Nations Conference on the Codification of the Law. The convention was being drafted, the law was being seen as in flux, and the court invoked this sort of mythical international legislature to say, it is not for us to set down the law and the legal principles when there is this process of codification and law creation taking place. In nuclear weapons, Despite the policy arguments of many states that nuclear weapons ought to be unlawful or should be seen as violations of um, the principles of proportionality and precaution and distinction in international humanitarian law, the court refused to accept this position, even, even when it paid lip service to the, the, the desirability of the policy objectives. Its task is to engage in its normal judicial function of ascertaining the existence or otherwise of legal principles and rules. It states the existence of law and does not legislate. This is so even if in stating and applying the law, the court necessarily has to specify its scope and sometimes note its general trend. Now, given that the court is situated within the international legal system, its, its statute is the UN Charter, the, its statute can be amended through state consent. And then secondarily, its jurisdiction depends on the consent of the states that appear before it. I think it's quite natural for the court to, to declaim this lawmaking function. I don't think it tells the whole story, though. I think the court participates actively in the development of the law. Part of that is because of the indeterminacy of the legal system itself. And if one accepts, and I, I think I'm hardly saying anything revolutionary here, Herbert Hart and Hans Kelsen both say, in any legal system there are gaps. There are gaps that are opened up by human error, 
by the nature of the legal system itself and the impossibility of the legal system to cover every possibility. I think, I think part of it comes in the fact that when we try to posit law, when we're not just applying judgments or working in a customary system where we resolve disputes as they come, we try to specify abstract principles. We try to specify them in such a way that they should apply to everything we can envisage. But it's nature, it's, it's in human nature that sometimes we don't envisage everything. And that technological, social, or political developments come in that, that not necessarily expand the scope of what we do, but rather serve to, um, to resituate that. But both Hart and Kelsen had faith in judges and granted them the necessary discretion within their legal orders to fill those gaps. And although that's formally missing in international law, I argue that the very existence of the legal system and the very fact that the court is an organ of international law engages with, interprets, and applies the law is participating not only as an agent, but as a powerful normative actor. And because the international legal system lacks a legislature, its judgments carry with them a heightened normative authority. They are listened to. They, they are tempting. There is nothing easier if you're, a, if you're a, a junior legal advisor working in the State Department or in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. If someone gives you a judgment that says this is the rule, they've just provided you with material evidence of the existence of that rule. It's not likely that you will reject that to go and conduct a survey of the state practice of 192 states to try to pull out from some papers the distillation of a rule when basically someone's done that for you. In that sense, the judgment as a means for the determination of the law um, begins to transcend that category and begin, begin to become the source of the law itself. And nowhere is that more apparent than in the practice of a court that consistently adheres to its previous decisions. And we see that in relatively new fields. We see that in international <coughs> criminal law, where the International Criminal Court makes extensive reference not only to its own case law, but also to the case law of the tribunals, the, the, the tribunals for Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Sierra Leone, etc. You see that in the WTO context, where the dispute settlement bodies all cite each other. And you even see it in the investment law concept, where every tribunal officially is its own tribunal, with its own rules of procedure, and constituted under its own bilateral investment treaty. But in reality, what they do is they cite each other extensively. Some would argue, somewhat incorrectly, even at times. But so, so in this respect, I guess my argument is that the form of judicial proceedings, while not ideal for developing the law, is a necessary component to the existence of the legal system itself. And then the big question is, is the court an organ of that legal system? And I think the answer is yes. Um, if you look at Herr Schlauterpacht, and that's, uh, who, who, who makes that argument, his, his presumption is that the International Court of Justice is that legal organ. Um, by taking a necessarily abstract rule of law to a concrete case, you crystallize and you codify that legal rule. You, you, you extend it, you confine it, you create exceptions, or you clarify its scope. You know where the trend is going, and maybe you even formulate it in such a way that it not only covers the case before you, but it provides an abstract rule that can serve for future application. So, the, so if this phenomenon is taking place, and it's being generally seen as authoritative, and even if many states don't recognize the jurisdiction of the court, they are willing to, um, to support the court in its functions. We've never seen a serious discussion, not even, for example, when the court issued the case between Nicaragua and the United States, when it issued the judgment that went against the United States. Although the Reagan administration at that time put some angry editorials in the New York Times and got very, you know, it, it huffed and it puffed at the General Assembly about the court and having two Soviet judges on it, etc., etc., the court did something, uh, the U.S. did something remarkable. It sat down with Italy, one of its major trading partners, and it dusted off a very old dispute between them about the expropriation of certain assets by Ameri uh, of American companies operating in Italy. And very quietly, the very next year, submitted a special agreement for that, for that case to be heard by the ICJ. It suggests that despite the fact that it didn't like those decisions that went in the areas of national security, use of force, etc., it still recognized the legitimacy of the court. And it's been argued elsewhere, I don't have the footnote in front of me, it's been argued by someone uh, contemporaneous with that decision that it was precisely a show of reassurance that the United States continued to support the rule of law in international society and with it, the court. Similarly, um, with the Avena cases and the Legrand cases, where the court found that there was a breach of international law by the US government, even though it was the state governments that were executing um, the, the individuals concerned, um, even though the United States pulled out of the relevant conventions and, and took itself out of the jurisdiction of the court for future disputes, 
it made, it made substantial efforts to comply with those decisions themselves. And in that sense, I think upholding, in upholding the rule of law in a much more substantive way than one would suggest. Mm -hmm. So, now I've, I've talked, I think, for quite long enough. Um, I, I, I think I'll stop at this point and open the floor to questions. Um, suffice to say, I mean, I mean, suffice to say, I think, I think the jaded realist view of international society as one where law is purely an instrument fails to apprehend the normative power of the law itself. It fails to apprehend how the law conditions the way we think. It conditions the way we take decisions. And it conditions the consequences that we think we will get out of them. And even though we're not always acting as legal actors, those of us who are international lawyers, I think very much find ourselves um, exposed to this and engaging with this. And Amongst those institutions that engage with international law, I think nowhere is that more apparent than with the International Court of Justice and other international courts and tribunals. It is, it is their activity that continues to sustain this, this tension, this debate within international society as to the, the proper role of law within that society. And I think that, that that part of the tale is a tale that's not completely told. And so my presentation today was just based on maybe trying to tell you how this court itself is situating itself and is making that claim and carving that place out in this very modest, careful way, but that that claim has wider consequences. Thank you very much. Can I just start off by asking a question? Of course. Or it's, it's two parts. So the first is, uh, so you made this like really fantastic argument that international law is really working when we don't see it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in other words, oftentimes it's constraining actors in ways that we don't even mm -hmm. uh, see or that where the issue isn't even raised in the first place or after the fact that they, they follow. Mm -hmm. And this is the realm of, so we get to the issue of interpretation. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question for you is, uh, how does your, you touched on it, but you didn't go into detail on it. Could you theorize a little bit more what you mean by interpretation in relation to your people and situate that in the larger project of your book. Okay. Just to give us a little bit of background about... It's a big question. What is the power, yeah. right? There's, there's a, a perennial debate about whether interpretation is the scientific empirical engagement with the law, one through which one uncovers or distills objective meaning, meaning usually placed as you know, the intention of the drafters. I mean, that's the debate you have here with the US Supreme Court about originalism. Um, there's a perennial debate as to whether you're uncovering objectivity or engaging in a subjective enterprise. Once one moves away from the objective model, and I think, I think it would be very irresponsible for a court to say that it abandons any pretense of objectivity, but once one theorizes about that, you come to a number of avenues. One is that, um, I think it's the Heisman principle in physics, that um, the fineness of the instrument through which we analyze molecular structures is insufficiently precise, that in the act of studying the molecules, or the, um, I think it's the, the quarks. Um, there you go. We are literally um, changing them. And as such, the very act of engaging, the very act of observation, changes the object of observation. If one applies that to law, one, one rapidly sees, especially in a system like international law, where you don't have that separation of powers, where you don't have the corrective function. If a judgment gets a point wrong, or if a judgment overstates a policy preference over another, or if its legal reasoning is not seen as tight, the judgment stands. It's binding between the parties. There's no appeal to it. And the only mechanism that's left is for states to go on developing in another way. In that respect, I think that the interpretation of, of, of any law by the court, so long as the court commands normative authority, is such that it changes the legal framework. It becomes part of international legal argument. Once that judgment is out, not only will the two parties to the dispute use that judgment against each other, but other states will also use them, those judgments. They will change and shift their strategy of argument. So, I'm trying to think. If Germany, actually, it, I mean, it happened, right? If Germany brings the US to the court and says, capital punishment, you know, you cannot have these trials for capital punishment without notifying our consulate first. Germany wins. 
The next day, Mexico and Paraguay write to, to the US and say, given that the, the obligation to X, Y, and Z you know, is, has been recognized by the court in another dispute, well, now we're invoking it against you. It is not that they adhere to it because it is the law. It is that by using that judgment to fulfill their political objectives, they are transforming that judgment into their legal preferences as well. And in the way that international law is created, which is much more complicated than just there's a legislator, it sits, it deliberates, it, it, um, it, it puts forward a law, um, that has a powerful normative effect. But it only has that normative effect if it has authority. If I do that, if I write out this is how it ought to be, that isn't going to command the same level of, um, of authority. It's not going to participate in the process in quite the same way. Now, actually, elsewhere, I argue that even when scholarship engages with these questions, engages in the interpretation of law, even basic, fundamental, black-letter scholarship, I think that very active engagement has the potential to do so. It's just, it's, it's a different potential. And, and it's perhaps a lesser potential because academics are not organs of the system in the way that a, that a judicial institution would be. But it's in Article 38 in subsection 4 there that they can refer to these scholars. They can. They can. So they can, if, if you make law like mm -hmm. this, yeah. you can use it. The court can actually use it. The court can use it. What's interesting though, there are two points I want to distinguish. The court consistently cites its previous decisions, all, right. all of them, even Southwest Africa. It very, very, very rarely cites authors. I think it has done so twice. Mm -hmm. It's very careful. Uh, there are strategic reasons. One of them is that it doesn't want to be seen as elevating a certain author over another one. Um, another one is the old linguistic battle. Well, know. Bruno Zimmer can't cite himself, right? But, uh, no. So that would probably well. <laughs> would like to do that. Yeah. Uh, he probably can't. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But I mean, interpretation, we can kick this up a bit if we're talking about customer international law. How yeah. do we how we determine, how does the court determine that we have rule of customary law? That's very interesting, actually. Customary law is one of those bugbears because we, we teach our students and we tell everybody that the proper way to, to, to identify custom is to look at state practice and this idea of opinion juris that states need to seem to feel that they're about. You know, how a state feels anything, first of all, is a bit beyond me. But um, be that as it may, what is interesting is that the court in proclaiming something to be customary. I think that's where it has that specifically powerful role. The court is very often the repository, is the source to which we refer to, mm -hmm. to say that something's custom. But the court never lets us into its method. So for example, in the right to passage case between Portugal and India, um, a question of what in civil law is called servitude, in common law is called an easement, was discussed as to whether Portugal had this easement on a little strip of Indian territory or vice versa. Anyway, Portugal sat down and look at the domestic law of 75 states, all of which recognize servitudes or easements, or what will you call them, and submitted them to the court. And the court, without explaining whether it looked at these, without considering whether it considered them, simply stated that there are servitudes in international law is customary law, full stop, moving on. That's its practice. It, it, it wraps, in that sense, I think- It has changed, hasn't it? Hasn't it Do you changed? think so? That, uh, I mean, for, for me, and this, this mm -hmm. goes beyond this a little bit. Of course. For, for me, uh, this discussion that you have, in, uh, where I have trouble, is mm -hmm. um, for, with regard to the rule of the court. I mean, the mm -hmm. uh, understanding of what sovereignty is mm -hmm. is changing, right? And mm -hmm. um, the, the concept of sovereignty mm -hmm. is merged to to the International Court of Justice, right? State actors consent. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the reason for this is, uh, is born from sovereignty. So if the concept of sovereignty changes, the role of the court might have to change too. I agree with you. I agree with you, but I would say one thing. Before that can happen, if there is a qualitative shift in how we view sovereignty outside the court, that shift has to be accompanied by how the court itself See sovereignty, but, and I see no indications in the. No right, but but how know? do we do this if uh, if the states, the mm -hmm. state actors, mm -hmm. are not willing? Well, they they are they are recognizing, you know, whether it's soft law or whatever, yeah. that the sovereignties change. Yeah. Um, whether they recognize this, but they don't want to make this change to the institution. So how mm -hmm. how how can the institution keep up with it? Mm -hmm. Should it always stay back there as a, an old uh, style sovereign? Mm -hmm. uh, based institution or organ, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. So in that sense, shouldn't, shouldn't you allow the court to develop this 
by itself? I don't know. The thing is, is I mean, I, I take your point. And I think that if international law is changing, I, I, I maybe take a slightly different view. I think it is evolving, but I don't think it's changing in this qualitative way. I think sovereignty is being reaffirmed. It, you know, if anything. Well, right. I mean, it goes back and forth, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Uh, we, we, it's, it's a different concept in the developed world than the developing world, yes. the world that just becomes mm -hmm. independent. They yeah. want to taste that sovereignty for a little bit yeah. before they realize, you know, that's really not what it, exactly. What exactly. it appears to be. Yeah. And you have, that, um, you have also that fundamental issue that sovereignty is also an inward looking thing. It's, of it's, course. It's, 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 it's that relationship of the state with its subjects and and that exists in different tensions at different times and, and history in that sense I think is really important um, is, is a really important methodology that, that, that lawyers need to be using to be more aware of how legal principles don't exist in a vacuum but are read there but but just in answer to your question just just uh, if I may I don't think the court even if there was a change in, in, in the environment around it I don't think the court would recognize that change unless there was a change in its statute. And I, I'm not entirely convinced that it should, because it's faced with all these other structural constraints. But, but isn't this a contradiction to your argument that, it, that we should not apply uh, our legal education, domestic legal education, or view on the international court? Because, mm -hmm. the, because the court should be, according to this, should be more a political organ, right? Or is more political, or, or in the, let's not say not political, independent. Mm -hmm. That you can't basically what you're saying, what you said earlier, is you can't really compare the Internet Court of Justice, or you shouldn't apply the principles that we learn in the United States, or that we learn in Canada or the UK. You shouldn't apply these rules to the Internet Court of Justice because it is essentially an organ of the UN, right? Not quite. It's more that the form of the international legal system is sufficiently and qualitatively different in the way it apportions powers and the, the, the subjects that it purports to govern and the fact that the subjects of international law are states which in turn, uh, you know, have, have their, that, that they project inwards and inwards. I think because of that we shouldn't look at constructions like equity, the judge rules of procedure, natural justice, in the same way that we can perceive within a, a constituted political community. I deny that international law is the same sort of political what about community. Human dignity? Show me a judgment of the ICJ that will recognize no. human dignity. No, that I mean, that's what I mean. But I mean but hu right. human dignity is a really interesting question because right. even within the if I take off my international law hat for a second and I'm I'm just a lawyer or a domestic lawyer, I'd say, well who's who's human dignity? Because I mean for example, even, okay, maybe I shouldn't wait into Obamacare, <laughs> but uh, different people have different conceptions of what that means. Exactly. And there is sufficient divergence within domestic law that to suggest that there's an international principle of human dignity, I think is, is very far-fetched and would be very difficult to justify um, on a coherent and um, rigorous basis in any way. I mean, I don't think there's practice in that regard. I think there's... Um, I don't think there's practice in that regard. I don't think states are very good at elucidating it. And I don't think the court has a very good track record for it. So, so isn't the legality of genocide a new uh, claim for, uh, that, uh, that's part of human dignity? Or torture, not to torture? Well, genocide is totally different. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I switch. Right? I, I, but I'll, yeah. Well, yeah, you go first. You're going off what Professor Hinkle said about the caveat that you gave, do not analogize mm -hmm. the concepts applied by the ICJ to mm -hmm. domestic courts. Mm -hmm. But then later on you say, okay, the court will only hear a dispute, A, mm -hmm. if it relates to something international, it won't interfere in domestic disputes, and B, it will only hear it if the parties in question subject themselves to the jurisdiction of the court. Mm -hmm. You cited the example of when the International Court of Justice ruled against the United States and you said that they did something and they sat down with Italy and then quietly went and asked for something else to be heard, which gave the international community hope that, you know, whether the United States does see the function of the United I guess I struggle to reconcile that standard applied where they say we will only hear a case if parties can subject themselves to the 
jurisdiction because how they understand law will obviously be founded off what they think law should be. I don't, agree. I don't agree. A citizen is not allowed to set the law for themselves. Uh, a citizen you assume is something that is not in evidence. There is no such thing as a citizen in international law. That's no. That's what I mean. I was that's talking about the best. Oh, okay, but I, I think. That's, that's I, but the I'm model, uh -huh. I think, you're looking at is not a model of a court. International criminal court. I never really thought this through before, but it is not a court. It is an arbitration panel. I think people have yeah. forgotten that. I really do because it is a situation where the di there must be a difference in the concept of rule of law. There must be something that separates law from non-law. There must be something that separates that which rules and that which does not rule. Mm -hmm. And it must be something more than just, I mean, uh, this court has normative power. You keep talking about the normative power. Fully agree with you. But it cannot be a court unless there's something beyond normative power. There is no such thing as a court that exists purely with normative force. Of course. And so what you, what you have instead is the, 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 the model of an arbitration panel where individuals consent for dispute resolution. And that mirrors why the U.S. would do what it did following Nicaragua. And that is not saying we feel that we are subject to this court, but we feel that this court is still a good place to resolve disputes. And that we want this system to be the method of dispute resolution between peers. Because when you're, when you're identifying a concept of a court, think of it this way. What is the direct consequence of an ICJ decision? They do not have any authority to order a secular body to deprive any entity of a right. Unlike any other court in the country, or any other court in the world, any other court has somehow a link to some other governmental power where they can say, you must do X. The court cannot order the Security Council to do anything. And so therefore, how can you say that it has a power of law? Whereas our Supreme Court can order, they can say, if you're going to operate under this constitutional system, they can order our president to do X. They can order our legislature to not do something. So therefore, they are linked to a secular, to a, to a, a tangible power, I should say. This court is not. So therefore, it appears to be more of an arbitration model where it makes a recommendation and it makes a finding that carries normative power. But ultimately, if it is going to be enforced, it is either enforced at the consent of the losing party or by some other entity, such as you take your arbitration, and you say, oh, I agreed to bargain, bargain, binding arbitration, but now I don't want to do it. Well, then they take that to then a real court, which would be, I guess, in a sense, the Security Council. But I mean, the, if, if I have a treaty, the UN Charter, um, that's law. Mm -hmm. And uh, arbitrary, every contract is law, right? I teach this, my right. right? So, so this is, so, so what, no. we first, what we first would have to talk about is, what is what is the law? The definition of contract right. is that which is legally enforceable. You're spending. But it's enforceable. It is. By what? It's entity? enforceable. If if I if I as a state am a member, it's enforceable. By what entity? Who is the, who is the law? The same, but, but see, this is where I agree with you, right? So I cannot I cannot apply the same principles to international law that I do uh, to domestic law. There's also a difference with arbitration, right? I have the New York Convention. But I mean, uh, uh, it does not have for me. It, it, I don't have to have the enforcement, the same enforcement mechanism. That's where I agree. I don't have to have the same enforcement mechanism that I have in in the United States to enforce a judgment against a different party. But uh, the one thing that international law works on is the reputation. Why are they following its reputation? It's the old Article Five in the uh, ECEC Treaty. Is its reputation? They don't want to be the bad actor. Why don't they want to? But that's a normative power. That's not a legal power. No, but that's in, but that's in, in the, you can enforce a judgment through that, right? Because I am willing to, for reputation, uh, for reputation purposes, I'm willing to follow that judgment to give consular uh, servants uh, access to my. How are you differentiating that judgment between what McDonald's does when they make a new policy for reputational purposes? Are they doing something legally then, or are they merely? Saying I'm going to voluntarily comply to social will. Okay. That is not law. But but hold on. Okay. I, th the thing is, is that I think that's where we depart. I see your point, but I don't agree with you on your concept of law. Mm -hmm. Is if law is about enforceability? I think you point through. Yeah. You know, and I, but I think I you you you're not, if. If law is, is if international law is merely about compliance, and compliance with the court's judgments is very, very high, there's no question of that. Even the reasons yeah. for that are separate. But if 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 the if the discussion turns on whether law 
is about compliance and enforcement, then sure. But I, I don't accept that idea. And um, Hart says that international law is not law, but not because it's not enforced. That's right. Because the process through which it becomes law is not clearly defined, and we don't have what he calls the secondary rules of definition. Right. 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 But if we take that, if we accept that premise, then the existence of law depends not on enforcement but on validity. That's right. On whether the law is positive in such a manner as it is seen to be valid. As it is seen to be valid as yeah. law. And thus the compliance issue comes up. No state argues that there is no such thing as international law. That's why they're states. They might quibble about the specific scope of certain obligations and certain rights, but they, up to now we I mean, unless you want to take Soviet Russia as an example of a state that, that's challenged the very notion of an international state system, you know, and then you could say that there's a challenge, but that, there's, that's no different than the Occupy movement or um, than a revolution uh, taking place in Syria right now. Um, the question is whether your concept of law is the developed model of the separation of powers, an enforcement mechanism, an executive, etc. On which I'll take your point, if, if that's your definition of well, law. I'm saying it does not have to have that separation. Yeah. I'm just saying that. If we are going to have a, if we are going to adhere to a value that is rule of law, mm -hmm. it must be we must be able to identify that which rules and that which does not. That's the that's the fundamental sure. rule of recognition okay. that Hart said. Sure. How can we identify mm -hmm. what rules and what does not? Mm -hmm. Well, I would actually reject that international law functions on the basis of the rule of law. That's that. I, well, I, I, I thought that's what you would say. No, no, no. I said, I, I, no. I said that the well, court. Otherwise, your argument would not work. Exactly. The court makes tentative steps to make a claim to authority, but it doesn't go so far as to say there is a rule of law. And I think, I think, I, I actually agree with you. If rule of law is an essential component to a legal system, the international system doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. There's no agreement on that. Fine. But I don't think you need rule of law to have a concept of law. And. If you, uh, Hart says international law is not law because we don't know how it becomes valid, but Kelsen says international law is law. It's just primitive. It's just a customary system. It's kind of like the common law in 12th century England, where the word of the king was the law. Yeah. And the judges sometimes applied corrective measures, but the judges were essentially agents and enforcers of the king's will. That is law too. It's arbitrary. It's no, very no, nice, absolutely, you know? but that's still you know, law. It's still law. It's still law. I guess the question, though, but, but how I, do I differentiate a normative responsibility from a legal responsibility in international law? Legal meaning enforceable. So no, I'm saying if, if if you're saying that it is law, if it is law, okay. How do I differentiate that from a okay. normative responsibility? Where what? How do I find what what is law versus just a normative responsibility? But or are they? I have to. Yeah. I, 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 why would you have to distinguish this? Then? No, no, no. I'm saying. If I'm trying to, I mean, yeah. clearly there is normative responsibilities. Lots of them out there. Sure. Are all normative responsibilities law? Can you give me an not? example of what you mean of a normative responsibility? Mm -hmm. Maybe we're just talking across purposes here. I would say that, for example, um, if an individual for Article One of the Genocide Convention, um, it's agreed that there is a normative responsibility to prevent genocide. Okay. Okay. I would say it's a legal responsibility. It, it might also be a legal responsibility. Mm -hmm. What did you look at that said it became a legal responsibility? What did I look at or what did the court look at? Because what I would say is, well, I'd, I'd say it's very easy in the sense, if you accept Article 38 as representing the sources of international law, there's debate on that. There's no trying to debate if it's just like you know the the the, 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 the applicable law for the sure. ICJ, or if it's more than that because it's in the charter and all that. And there's a comp but if you if for a moment we accept it because that's how we teach it in our textbooks, that's how we practice it. Treaties are written law; they are law. Custom is unwritten law; it is law. General principles are unwritten and written law, and maybe not law; <laughs> they are law. Judicial decisions, writings of publicists, not law means for determination of the law. But the ICJ, so, the, mm -hmm, the ICJ yeah. decision in Bosnia v. Serbia, yeah. when they analyzed that Article 1, yeah. said that the legal mm -hmm. responsibility under there Precisely. is not to engage in genocide Precisely. yourself. Precisely. And that's what they limited it to. Yeah. Because now, I would believe true. that there is also a use Kogan's normative, well, that gen doesn't no. make sense, but a normative responsibility to prevent genocide. But, but, that, but that would mean that the general principle is not law. Or another way of saying, it, I just think some, maybe you have an idea. So I, 
I hear what you're saying. My understanding of what you're saying is that can law operate outside of the state form? And you as and another way to so like when Rich talks about law, you are talking about enforcement. The exception to like a Schmittian Razian. I'm going back to that fundamental question so that is you, involuntary jurisdiction. So you touch to the idea of the state form. In every notion I have, you attach an idea of law to there has to be a state form. What I find really fascinating in, in your account is these international institutions or the ICJ is creating international law through this interpretive mechanism irregardless almost of the state form. And not, not in the state form, precisely. Right, and the fact that maybe states all of a sudden dissolved and we had different regional bodies operating according to different rules, right? We could still imagine... But because it's created by states, you could say it's indirectly by state form, right? Well, he, but I think there's something even more exciting in that, irregardless of, I mean, like, obviously, my God, states are doing things and it matters, but even if the, the ICJ is doing something uh, that isn't, is creating law that is irrespective of what states do in practice, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's an exciting Would you say source. That, that it does this irrespective, there's always a connection. They don't, they're not that uh, uh, revolutionary so, so, or that dynamic that they totally create something new. I've not seen any decision there where they create a totally new principle. I agree with you. They're very modest in the substance so of the it's principles. It's like, like evolutionary, right? I, I, if anything, I'd say that the court tends to drag behind, and it's the last right. body to recognize anything, and it waits till everyone else has accepted it, and then it kind of gives its royal stamp of approval at the end of the whole process. <laughs> I know, that's a bit... Uh, that's no, no, but I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, in one sense, that's how they do it, and that's also, of course, the problem. And the, the question then becomes, are they really... Creating but then, it, it, but but I, yeah, I think Christoph, you raised two really good points. I think there a distinction can be drawn. One of them is it progressive? My answer is no. No, absolutely not. But is it creating the law? Yeah, I'd say yes. Yes, because it inches like a, like a, a snail yeah. towards a certain goal. Exactly. And, but uh, my argument is that this goal that okay, so I don't look at the court and say it has this goal. Mm -hmm. The, the way I look at it, it's, it's the realities, whether the change in understanding of sovereignty or whether yeah. the judges change, the yeah. perception of the judges, the bias mm -hmm. that they have, yeah. will push that little snail towards, yeah, exactly. towards that change. Yeah. Or not, yeah. And again, if we can get back to Richard's point, if that's all right. Yeah, what I'm really, that you started off by talking about the consensual jurisdiction, the consensual yes. jurisdiction. Yes. In theory, a true court depends on non-consensual jurisdiction. It must have power when people do not want to be there. But that, that, that's my basic claim, is that, that you've just said it, that the true essence of a court must be that. I mean, isn't that exporting a domestic law conception of what a court it is? is? It is exactly. No, no, no. If, if we call it a court and we constitute it in a certain way, isn't that contributing? Like, isn't that, I mean, is there an objective meaning of Has court? Has not all courts isn't it a norm that all courts develop in that pattern? Even if they start moving in a normative way, once their opinions get ignored, they start having enforcement. But, the court's the judgment. but hold on, the court's judgments are binding. It says so in the statute, which is a part of the UN Charter. And if, if, and it doesn't happen often because compliance is so high, but if party A refuses to accept it, party B goes to the Security Council and asks it to enforce. Now, the Security Council has discretion and sometimes it chooses not to exercise it. And that's the dilemma. Isn't that then the source of law? Because if mm -hmm. the Security Council refuses to enforce it, are they not but, yes. overruling? But only the if your concept of law is based on enforcement, not compliance. And that's the Hobbes versus Benjamin sort of thing. Right. You know? If you if you if you're a Hobbesian and law is about enforcement, fine. I'm not a Hobbesian. I think Hart's right. I think he's wrong on a lot of things, but I think on this point, he's right that compliance and the internal compliance of the actors within the system. You know, because Hart says you can have a beautiful legal system and if everyone ignores it, it's not law anymore. But it really takes everyone not ignoring it. That's how he explains violations of criminal law. That's how he explains breaches of contract. Right. No, no. I, I understand. And I think there's something there. I'm looking at, there must be a limit on law. Otherwise, law, sure. like any other power, will expand okay. the point. Sure. And so what I'm asking is, and here, here's our dilemma, if we, if we create a system where we say this is law mm -hmm. as to what they do, yeah. and we accept the axiom 
that they had the ability to create law. Yeah. Then if they had ruled the opposite and said that, no, the reservation of Article 9 of the Genocide Convention violates use Kogan and Storm, so yeah. therefore you must consent to our jurisdiction. Yeah, you must appear before us, right? Then, then I ask you, what, if anything, limits their authority for absolute power? What is the check on the ICJ's power, ultimately? Now you're back to Hobbes. But also back to a separation of power structure right. that doesn't apply in international law. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we don't have checks and balances. International law is not a system based on it. I, I would actually argue that checks and balances is a specifically American construct. Uh, we don't have checks and balances in, formally speaking... No, 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 but I'm, just, you know, I'm, I'm not saying not a check. And maybe I'm being it wrong, but I'm saying what prevents despotism? What prevents totalitarianism? Theoretically. In international law? If the ICJ mm -hmm. does not see a limitation on its jurisdiction or authority other yeah. than self-imposed, ultimately what prevents it? Well, that's, I mean, as the ICJ is currently structured. If you allow it to expand its power. If you say, ah, we can now interpret that we don't need consent for jurisdiction any longer. Now, but which one do you want? You want it, you want it to expand the power or not? You want it to limit, to be limited or not? What do you want? I want it to expand pursuant to agreed upon rules or be limited or be limited. Agreed, but it can but it, I think that's what it's but for. it should not be self entirely self regulated because then it'll be just like any other human entity and it will expand its power to the point of totalitarianism that's the, the true in every human experience if it is if its limitations are entirely self imposed they eventually evaporate well i agree with you so I I'm, not, I'm not sure if I agree 100% with this is because certain self-regulations, if they're incentives, they could regulate themselves. Let me be the devil's advocate here. <laughs> well, that could be the incentive for the ICJ is if you don't behave, we we'll get rid of you, right? I, exactly. Exactly. The, the incentive for the SDJ is that is we get rid of you and don't go too far in right, general. That's, right they are, that's why I'm not progressive, right? And and I'd say that that, that uh, that's why I situate it specifically in consent as a legal document. Mean, but it, so for me the interesting thing is this when I compare this for example to the ECJ, right? Yeah. The ECJ was in the beginning just like that too. Yeah. But yeah. once it was more established within a system where sovereignty is different. Mm -hmm. It now is, there's almost study sizes there. Yeah. You know, uh, and so I think in that sense it, it changes, but I think, you know, that's the ultimate, if you want to call it a check, is the, I'm, I'm going to get rid of you. And the okay. rich would come up, would you say at that point, well, then it's not rule of law because there's... But he, right, but he, just, he already there. conceded no rule of law. No, but, but for me it's like this, right? For me it goes back to reputation again, right? If, if you are not a good, and, and by the way, the United States is generally perceived as an actually good international actor. Yeah. They, they might say, you know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, I don't care about, uh, like Oklahoma might say, I, I don't care about international law, but in reality, because business is the way it is, they, they abide by it. But so in terms of reputation, right, if Venezuela says, you know, I'm, I'm expropriating these oil fields that you develop, I'm not going to go over there again. Yeah. Now, you see, it, it, it may seem odd, but I've actually wanted it. Who likes to expand the ICJ's authority? And I have a specific proposal that I sent to John that, that lends toward where I, how I analyze it as a arbitrary panel that determines that, meaning uh, separately. Um, I, 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 I look at that arbitration as it is, for example, giving a, a self-limiter eliminating their excuse for self-limitation, specifically um, on battlefield privilege, privilege belligerency. Basically, privilege belligerency is a self-limitation. Be based on agreement, of a state will not prosecute the military of a, uh, uh, another state engaged in armed conflict for the acts, lawful acts of combat. Mm -hmm. That's the concept of privilege belligerency. It exists in theory, or I mean, an idea under Geneva Convention and Hague Conventions, but it really comes down to state practice of so that state deciding not to practice. Well, I, I, I propose the idea that the ICJ has, well, one, we go back to Hague 3 and mandate that there is no armed conflict or right to privilege of the without a declaration of war, and that all declarations of war can be challenged before the ICJ by any interested entity to include uh, um, an idea of, I, I, I would expand definitions of war to include declarations against groups or individuals. But see, that's radical. That's pretty radical. Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. But 
What I, what I give the ICJ is the authority in any state, let's say that we declare a war against Al-Qaeda and there's a member of Al-Qaeda in Jamaica. Jamaica has the authority to go to the ICJ and challenge the U.S.'s declaration of war as being a proper use of force under the, uh, under the charter. And the ICJ could declare it as an invalid war, which does not force the Security Council to do anything, but it gives Jamaica or any other countries the authority then to prosecute violations that occur of their domestic law and ignore privileged belligerency. But that would mean there is no, there cannot be any kind of sovereignty anymore. Because one of the, one of the uh, basic principles of sovereignty is that if you encroach on mine, I can declare war. Pleasure. What's Article 51? Well, no, 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 and Article 51 only recognizes, doesn't right. create it the right Again, no, again, no, no, all I'm saying is, you may declare, I don't care about that. I'm just saying that one legal aspect of your declaration, the idea that your soldiers get privileged belligerency, mm -hmm. can be removed. But I, hold on, I'm just trying to understand the, the scope of the argument. Your, your claim would be that if we entrust this to an objective impartial body, that we would have a better system for the, the idea of privileges belligerency. Yeah. Is that, is that, I'm not an IHL that's specialist, so I'm kind of trying to, I, it's, 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 it's more, in essence, what I mean, yeah. the idea is yeah. that I want declarations of war to be challengeable by a non-political entity. Mm -hmm. And in theory, I'm saying that then therefore the SCJ is our arbitration panel that is non-political. Sure, but, it, okay, there's no denying that the, the root of international adjudication, and by that the court, is in arbitration. There's no denying that that's how it started with, you know, the ad hoc arbitral tribunals, then the BCA, then the BCIJ, then the ICJ, and each of them is built on the experience of the other. I actually have a chapter in my book where I say exactly what you're saying. We start with arbitration, but I break with you. I think we end somewhere else. Because we, we have, in the meantime, constructed an international legal system. And as imperfect and as strange as it is, the ICJ is a part of it, it's a legal organ of that system. And that system is not just the UN Charter. It's the thicket of multilateral and bilateral conventions around it, it's customary law, it's the institutions that are in place, all overlapping and playing with one another in a way that we don't fully apprehend uh, when we're domestic lawyers. But that we can, I mean, obviously we, we can, that's why we theorize about PIL all the time. I would argue that the ICJ has been very timid in arrogating for itself a non-arbitral role. So I think we don't, we don't disagree there. But I would say that in other ways it is stepping beyond that. And actually, that's to go back to your point, I'd say it steps beyond the procedural but not the substance. Right. So that's where my discussion is. It, it claims all these inherent powers, it claims the authority to decide precedent, it claims all of this, and then when you ask it to enforce a community interest or to yeah. declare public order, it goes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Um, fundamental human rights, forget it. Um, Non-state actors. But it's too much. It's Do they only argue inherent and not implied powers? Well, that, that was the no, they argue implied powers, but but they, they don't use the words exactly. No, that's can, it depends on which legal tradition you look at. Some yeah. will use uh, implied powers. They argue implied powers in the context of the UN. Well, if you say competence, mm. competence, that's what exactly. you have. Then. Exactly. They, the, in, implied powers come within the institution. Inherent powers come by uh, through right. its essence as a judicial institution. So that, that, that's how it distinguishes it. Yeah. But what is what is interesting, uh, and this is if you compare actually to domestic uh, development in the United States, the way arbitration is developing in the United States, yeah. the way the Supreme Court is pushing arbitration mm -hmm. is actually very similar to what happened with the Internet Court of Justice, because mm -hmm. uh, increasingly the arbitral panels are almost becoming more court-like yeah. because the yeah. Uh, uh, Scalia in one of his cases basically has said now you have to decide mm -hmm. about unconscionability, right? Mm -hmm. You have to decide whether uh, contract clauses are unconscionable. Mm -hmm. uh, under competence, competence of the arbitration panels, it used to be reverse. So mm -hmm. you, uh, what you see is that it's a, a quite an interesting development in, in, in terms of mm -hmm. domestic development, in terms of arbitration when you compare this to uh, the ICJ. It's very interesting. Yeah, this is interesting, but. Uh, you know, but I, I think it's more, I agree with Sim, I think it's way more than an arbitration panel, but that's, it's a, if you want to say dispute resolution, uh, uh, fine, but I mean then we just, the question is, well, what does court mean? Yeah. Right. Is, is it, does court mean I have to be able to enforce, does it mean it's an, uh, the ultimate arbiter? Yeah, and I, 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 can, I, can, I, can I point that something? Just yeah. that I didn't talk about the court's advisory function, because I was right. really going to run out of time, but that, that's a big part of this analysis.
But consider this, in the US, it would be anathema for the president or for Congress to ask the court, we'd like to do this, what do you think? And then for the court to publish an opinion. I mean, this is just not accepted. Yeah. But in Canada we do it, and in India they do it, and I think yeah. in Switzerland they do it too. ICJ too. Exactly, and the ICJ does it. And, and in Belgium and France they have a separate institution, the Conseil d'État, which literally goes and does it for them. And so, it's, you know... We don't do it because it's a jurisdictional limitation on the court. Fine, it's yeah, and I understand, <laughs> but it makes sense in the US's delicate and thought out right. constitutional separation of powers. But it's different. But in reality, in reality, I think you can achieve the same goal here too. If yeah. the branches of government don't agree and they go to the Supreme yeah. Court, yeah. essentially, when the Supreme Court rules, it gives an opinion. Yeah. And then the branches of government will have to decide which way they go. It, it, it's just that in function, in practice, it just takes more time and it gets a bit more complicated. You know? um, um, I mean, you're right. I mean, that's it's how. The same you thing, know. Really. Exactly. I mean, I, Actually, an interesting one is the gay marriage aspect, because in Canada, there was a reference to the Supreme Court. The court said it violates the charter to have these restrictions, so the, court, the, the, the government the next year put in a law. Here, what's happening is that state by state, it's being challenged and right. it up to the court exactly. 10 years it just later. Takes, right. yeah. It's just a time limitation, right. but it does have impact on people's lives. So, for right. example, if, if there's an expropriation of the bank oh, sure. you know, or something, it takes, I mean, it, it can be expensive. Um, but I think there's an interesting point there, just basically about, about the role of law in a society and what role the court plays within it. it. Is the court part of sort of the fabric of it, enforcing it, or is the court more removed and just the, 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 the backstop of last resort? And I think different legal systems cognize that differently. Right, and I mean, if you have a very conservative civil law uh, jurisdiction, they will say the only thing you can do is, uh, um, you know, dispense what's right, mm -hmm. um, you can't look at other precedents or, or decisions, but if you have a, a lesser conservative civil uh, jurisdiction, they will look at the decision, whether you take Canada, where Canada is not Germany, whether mm -hmm. you take Germany, for example. You can compare, for example, Germany for, with Estonia. Mm -hmm. Germany is very liberal, Estonia is very conservative, so yeah. Estonia will say, I'm not going to even look at what, this, what you just said, even if you're the judge next door. And in Germany, they would say, I, of course, will look at what the, uh, the state court has said, or the yeah. highest uh, state mm -hmm. or uh, federal court has said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so I always wonder if the specific form of law, you know, so another way of asking Rich's question is, what's the difference between regulation and law, mm -hmm. right? Or what's the difference between politics and law? Yeah. Yeah. And, and one way I think about it is just like, when we look at law, we see a non-legal body. Right? Like it's exactly the fact that they don't have enforcement that makes it law. Mm -hmm. Right? As opposed to a king who has a scepter and <coughs> as he wields it down, his feudal, you know, knight yeah, yeah. chops the sword. Yeah, Whereas yeah. it's exactly the fact that law doesn't have an enforcement mechanism mm -hmm. that is the specific form that is law. Right? So yeah. when I go to the court, yeah. right, I know that when the, you know, Scalia makes a decision, mm -hmm. I know that that doesn't mean Scalia's guards then go and grab me by the arms and take me out. That's a different thing that's happening, mm -hmm. right? So I think we could all. So enforcement again goes off the. Well, that's Hart's argument, isn't it? I, I mean, find it interesting. Yeah. I mean, um, mm -hmm. I had to. I taught jurisprudence this year for the first time, and I had to go back and read the concept of law. And there's that one chapter where he talks about Rex, and so you know, yeah. Rex comes in, and the first law is everything Rex says is the right. law. And then, oh, but what about, what about if I say something contradicting me before, okay, how, and, and then suddenly you start moving towards it. You move away, further and further away from enforcement, then Hart uses that to prove that enforcement is not the foundation of law, and that it's compliance, and, and the internal aspect of, of law, like he calls it. Um, and I think that makes sense if you're willing to take a pluralist perspective and accept, for example, that Aboriginal legal systems yeah, or non-written legal systems are law. I think they are law. No, they are. I mean, they're just weird to but, us. You know, yeah, they don't. Absolutely. You know. I mean, if you look in South America, the mm -hmm. land uh, rights, you know, yeah. you're interested in that too, right? So that's absolutely law. Yeah. Let me challenge, push back at that for a second. There might be a difference, though, between regulation and law. So we can't, instead of collapsing law, yeah across all time and places. So when Hammurabi put his code in place, or yeah. when King John, or Preston John, who didn't even exist, or you know, we can't collapse 6,000 years of something into law, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think, I will propose that, right? So, yeah. okay. in, so possibly unwritten law mm -hmm. is law, mm -hmm. 
Right, or possibly it's something else. That's how it started, no? Except, well, I don't, if we don't buy into the idea of like, from kinship, like this story, right? I do. Okay, like, I think <laughs> this is a very suspicious story. So I think if we just push the heart move a little bit mm -hmm. harder, I'm not saying that it's not as legitimate. I'm not saying it wasn't a form of very meaningful regulation that was structured in a society. But I do think possibly, I put this to you, right? If law is inherently tied to being non-political, I'm thinking in sociological terms, like law is not, it is a non-political, but obviously politics no, come in. Not. It has no enforcement mechanism. If that's part of the nature of law, in that it's, it, that's part of the formal equality of law. Irrespective of your political economic position, the formal equality of law allows you to come here, right? I think that's something specific to law. So I wouldn't so say that necessarily, just like in the feudal times, we might not talk about that as law, but a different form of regulation, right. or pre-feudal. Mm -hmm. Unless we want to collapse Hammurabi and modern... But there's no apolitical. My, my no, not that on. there's not always politics and distributional stakes, yeah. but the specific form of what is law. Like, what do we mean when we talk about law? as opposed to regulation, po po politics. Do you want to right, but, 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 there, but yeah. there is something, okay. The Pope orders me to go attack the Holy Land for the Crusades. Right. That's a normative authority to give me what I claim to be justice. Mm -hmm. But that's not law. And we all would agree that that does not. Yeah. But there is something about law mm -hmm. that would give someone, one individual, yeah. the ability to use force against another. Mm -hmm. There's some aspect about law that gives you normative force to be able to do that, right? Because that is, I get to enforce a judgment. I, if they don't, if they, if they will not comply, there's something about law that says this is still okay. If you're doing it for your religious, purpose, no, that's not right. If you're doing it because you think it's logical, no, that's not enough. But if law says it's okay for you to do it, then it has normative thumbs up. Rich, can I contest one just for yeah. the other thing? I don't think it gives you normative force. I think it gives you legal force. That's I think right. that's different. It is, I think, crazy. The fact that law authorizes you to do it is the only reason you're allowed to do it. Which means that if the Security Council allows Canada to bomb the US, for whatever reason, then that is legally binding because the Charter says so. The reason, the normative basis for Canada wanting to invade the US, that's so why I'm not even What's the reason. significance of that legal? Uh, of, of labeling illegal then. Of labeling illegal. Yeah. And in other words, yeah. by, by saying, oh, I did this yeah. pursuant to law or under legal yeah. authority yeah. or law, yeah. how is that, what's the significance? Isn't it a normative power? Isn't it a normative evaluation? Because it complied with law, it is a norm, normative better than a, it did not comply with law. Well, yes, because all law, all legal orders are normative orders, right? The form of law right. is do this, don't do this. You know, it's very, you know, okay. Kelsen. Um, but, no, 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 sorry. I take your point that law gives you the normative authority when you're making a political argument, etc. But you wouldn't need to do that in a court afterwards. You would simply say, the council's resolution da, 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 says I can do this, I did this. I followed the council's wording, the text of the wording, you know, precisely. I've breached no obligation. To, to anybody. If there is a dispute, like, like, to give my example, there's a Security Council resolution, Canada bombs the US, or Canada's authorized to bomb the US, it does so. Yeah, that's why I'm being very far-fetched. I'm not giving, there's no need for a reason. The council determined there was a threat to peace and security, and it authorized it. The US brings a claim to the SCJ, says Canada has caused $3 billion of damage to property, lives, whatever. It has also breached the crime of aggression, has done this and this and this. The court will look at this and it will say, I mean, this is how the ICJ functions, I think. It would say, was the act legal? Yes, because there, was, there is a law that I can point to, Security Council Resolution XXXX. Was there a breach of that law? It will look at the text of that resolution, it will see whether the acts fit within that text. It'll probably say that, they, in my case, let's say that, that that's not the question. But the question is the legality of the... But you're presupposing that the United States is then challenging this issue before the ICJ. 
Well, yeah, I'm mean, trying to, I mean, and you mean, asked what, about what, how, what is, how do we resolve it. Yeah. You're creating a, exactly. a secure system inside. I'm saying yeah. that it is not just but, but, within yeah. itself self-validating. Mm -hmm. I'm saying there's something about law that validates action external to itself. Okay. In, in, in social conduct, I did this. I yeah. grabbed Jim yeah. and pulled him in and threw him into a, a, a confinement area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Now you're saying, well, he could challenge it in court. I'm saying, no, Jim, I, I have to be able to justify to the world as a whole. How come I could grab Jim? Yeah. Not to a court, but to the world. Of oh, course. Cool. And I say I could do it because the law allowed me to. Exactly. Yeah. So, and no. I agree. And isn't that mean that, because if I said I did it to Jim mm -hmm. because he's a bad, he's a bad guy, yeah. you would say, but that does not hold as much significance, as much normative value as me saying I did it pursuant to law. No, and I wouldn't say that. I would say the legal system would say that, and thus the court. But I, I can, where I break with Kelsen and where I completely agree with you is that law conditions human behavior. And the law is part of politics, just as much as politics are part of law. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. But I don't think that that has to do... Kelsen would tell you how you justify what you did is immaterial if you use extra legal justification for his concept of law. He would literally tell you it is not relevant. Mm. I don't agree with him. But okay. for the purposes of cognizing law, non-law, he makes a fair point. But I think that because law is more complicated than that, because law is messier than that, we do need to think about these justifications. We do need to think about how cloaking things with the veneer of legality then allows people to do certain things. Um, it allows you to expropriate, right. you know, to be very business and clinical about it. it allows you to commit crimes that some people would say are war crimes, um, bomb hospitals, uh, it allows you to invade another country. You're, you're right, right, you're right about that. Innocence. You're right about that. It, it's part of the arsenal of rhetoric that we use to justify our political choices. I won't defend the court in that sense, because the court uses that whole custom thing. It tries to clean everything out and just look at only the law and say that everything else is irrelevant, and, and I think that limits its utility as an actor. My basic point, actually, my book is very anti-court anti in a sense. Or not anti-court, but it says, if you're progressive and you think that hope is in the court bringing an in international rule of law, you're wrong. Because the court doesn't want that, it doesn't see itself as part of an actor within that, boom, you know? But I agree with you that if we, if we exclude the court and we talk about how people justify things, law has a specific and a really important role to play.